I assume you all see my screen, if not, uh, tell me. So as uh, Marcus said, my name is uh, Rachel Ben Eliyahu Zohari. Uh, I'm from the Software Engineering Department in uh, Azrieli College of Engineering in Jerusalem, Israel. And my talk is about uh, splitting a logic program efficiently. And I'll uh, begin with an introduction. So uh, suppose we're having a disjunctive logic program like this, and we would like to uh, compute the stable model or the stable models of this uh, program. And uh, as you all know, it's a, it's a hard task, as the task is uh, NP-hard. Uh, so we are trying to find ways to do it uh, more efficiently. And uh, uh, Turner and Lifshitz came with the idea of a splitting set, okay? And what is the idea of a, of a splitting set? A splitting set is a set of atoms uh, that allow, allows us to split the, the logic program into two parts. The first part is called the bottom. It, it, it consists uh, of rules that uh, uh, all the atoms in those rules in the bottom are from the splitting set, okay? And the other part of the program is uh, the top, which is the other, uh, the other rules, okay? Now, once we have a splitting set that uh, splits uh, the program as I explained, how do we compute uh, the stable model? Uh, we compute the stable model, model of the bottom. Uh, we propagate the model into the top. Uh, we compute a stable model of the reduced top. And then we uh, combine the models, actually we, we simply unite them, okay? So let's go back to our uh, uh, program example. So suppose uh, the splitting set is uh, A, B, E, and H, okay? So what I do, I, I, I look at the rules that they have only these atoms. Sorry, I uh, wanted the timer, sorry, okay? So we are looking at the, at the rules that have uh, only these atoms. So it's uh, the rules that I circled with the red, uh, red uh, line. Okay, so this, 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 and this. So now I compute a stable model of uh, rule number one, two, six, seven, and eight. And I get actually two models, which is A, H, uh, and B. Okay, now what I do, I propagate to the top. So, uh, I have, uh, as I said, two models. So suppose I take the first model, which is AH, I propagate it to the top. So this is the top, this is the rest of the program. So what happens is since B is false, we don't have this body. And uh, now I compute a stable model uh, of this uh, uh, program, of the top, and I get that there is one model which is F, and I combine the model and I get a stable model which is A, H, and F. Now, suppose that I took the other model of the, of the bottom, which is B. So again, I, I look at the top. I uh, reduce the program. So here, since B is true, this rule is not relevant anymore. So we have two rules. And then we, com we compute the stable model. And we get uh, that the stable model is, uh, can be F or C and G. So we, have an, and we, we found actually two more models, which are B and F, or B, C and G. Okay, so this is the idea of splitting. And of course, you cannot take any set of uh, atoms and, and make them a split set. They have to have a, a special a, a character. And this is a definition. So a splitting set for a program P is a set of atoms U, such that for each rule R of the program, if one of the atoms in the head of the, of the rule is in you, then all the atoms that are in, in rule are also in you, okay? So clearly there are uh, some trivial uh, splitting sets, which are the empty set and the, uh, and the set of all atoms in the program. But of course, these uh, trivial uh, sets will not help us in the computation. Okay, so um, you can see that actually the set that I defined uh, before, that I, I, I uh, identified before, A, B, E, H is indeed a splitting set. And uh, yes, you can see that uh, actually all, all the rules that have heads in this, in this uh, set is one, two, six, seven, and eight. And you can see that all the atoms in these rules are actually, are, are actually in the splitting set. Okay. 
So the question is, how do we compute efficiently a non-trivial splitting state? So what we show in this work is that we can uh, compute a non-trivial minimum size a uh, splitting set in a time which is polynomial in the size of the program. Okay, so how do we do it? Uh, actually, uh, we will see later that uh, the algorithm that we show here is not only for minimum number. We can have some other uh, uh, desirable properties. For example, if we want a splitting set uh, that uh, touch that the bottom is uh, an H HCF, a head cycle free program, which is easier to comp compute. Or if we want a bottom that uh, such that, if we want the, 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 the splitting step to include the, some special atoms that we are interested in. Okay, so uh, the algorithms that we, sh I, we show here is, is uh, for computing minimum size sets but uh, you can also adapt it very easily uh, to compute the uh, splitting sets with other uh, properties. Okay, so as uh, the best basic idea of the algorithm goes to the dependency graph of the, of, the, of the program. So what is a dependency graph? So again, this is the program that I showed you before. So in the dependency graph, we put a, a vertex for each, uh, for each atom. And we have a, an arc from an atom X to an atom Y if there is a rule uh, where X is in the body and Y is in the head. So this is, if you, if you ignore for, for a moment uh, the dotted the red lines, so this is the graph, the dependency graph of the program that we show with the two heads, okay? Now a strongly connected component is a set of uh, vertices that are connected to each other with a directed path. Okay, uh, it's, it's, it's a set of atoms such, a, such that for each two atoms in the set, there is a pass from one to the other, okay? And we can talk about the, the strongly connected component that includes a special atom X. Okay, now we can talk about the super dependency graph. What is the super dependency graph? We take each maximal a strongly connected component and we make it a vertex. Okay, so this, now, now please uh, look at the red or at, or of the dotted, the uh, uh, red dotted lines. So this is, a, this is a strongly connected component, a, a maximal size, and this is a strongly connected component, and this and this and this. So these are going to be the uh, vertices of the super dependency graph. And we have an arc from a, one uh, a strongly connected component to another. If in the original graph we have an arc, uh, from, uh, from one of the atoms here to one of the atoms here, okay? We have a super dependency graph, which is, uh, it, it is a, a directed uh, acyc acyclic graph. Okay, so in this graph, uh, we have, of course, a source, which is, a, it must have a source, which is, a, a, or it could have several sources, which is actually a, a vertex that, that have no incoming uh, edges. And we define also the tree of X. Uh, if we have an atom X, the tree is all the atoms that, ha that have a pass to the to, to X. Okay, so the tree of F is uh, A, B, C, and D, and F is F. Okay, so uh, I, I, I repeat, a tree of, 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 of a variable X is all the atoms that uh, have a pass from them to X. And similarly, we can define the tree of R, where, as, where R is a rule, uh, which is the, the, uh, the union of all the trees of the atoms that we have in R. Okay, so now what is the connection to splitting? Okay, so first of all, it so happens that a splitting set cannot contain a proper subset of a strongly connected component. So it cannot be the case that a split, for example, if this is a, a splitting set, a, sorry, if this is a source, it cannot be the case that a splitting set has E, but it doesn't, has, it doesn't have H. Okay, this is one thing that we can show, we show in the, in the paper. The second is that if a splitting set contains an atom from the head of a rule, it contains the whole tree of the rule. Okay, 
So for example, if, if we have a, a splitting set that, that has F, okay, then it must have the whole tree of F. So in, the, in our example, the splitting set, if it has F, it has to have all these uh, atoms as well, okay? So the corollary of all these uh, uh, findings is that actually every splitting set is a collection of trees, a tree as I uh, defined it uh, here. And the question is, how do we find uh, this collection uh, of trees? Okay, so what we do, we use good old search. Uh, so I'm using search algorithms, uh, search algorithms from old, good old <laughs> AI that uh, some of us are teaching now, or many of us have, uh, have, have learned, okay? And uh, I'm taking here, you can see here uh, an algorithm from uh, the book by Russell Novig. Uh, how do we do search? I just give a review. Uh, so in the tree search, we have a problem, which is defined as a search problem, and we have a strategy. And what we do, we start with, uh, with, the, with the root of the tree, is the, is the initial state. And uh, uh, we are trying to expand, uh, expand the tree. Okay, if there are no candidates for expansion, we return failure. Otherwise, we choose a leaf uh, for expansion, and the, we choose a leaf according to the strategies that we have. But we might have several leaves, so we uh, choose one uh, according to the strategy. If the one that we chose is a ball state, we stop. If not, uh, we compute the children of this uh, uh, state and we add them to the tree. Okay, and the strategy, the strategies that I'm going to, to use here is the uniform cost, which is, a, which is actually inspired by the Axtra algorithm, which, say, which says uh, take the node that uh, has the minimum cost, the minimum cost of the past from the root. Okay. Okay. So now the question is, how do I formulate the task of computing? a minimum size splitting set as a search problem. Okay, so what do I need? Uh, I need a, a state space, I need an initial state, I need a goal, st a goal test, and I need a way to uh, take a state and find the neighbors. Okay, so what is a state space? The state space is a collection of forests, which are subgraphs of the super dependency, dependency graph of this. So each, actually, each, uh, each uh, state is going to be a collection of trees, okay? We start, uh, the initial state is going to be the empty set, which is the empty tree, and uh, then we add the trees until we find a split set, that idea of the search. Uh, the goal test is, of course, a state that represents a splitting set. And now the question is, how do I uh, go to the neighbors in this uh, uh, search uh, space, okay? So if I'm in the initial uh, state, I can go to a state which is actually a source, okay? I can take, I can just uh, add to the, the initial state one of the sources, okay? That's the, the neighbors. So, so each neighbor of the initial state is a source, okay? Now, in, a, in any other case, which is not the initial state, so uh, we have only one possible action, we find, uh, so of, of course, if the state is a goal state, it's a splitting set, we stop. Uh, if it's not a splitting set, we find the lowest rule. We, we assume that the rules are ordered. We find the lowest rule R according to which uh, the state or the, the set of atoms that the set represents is not a splitting set. There must be a, a rule that shows us that it's not a splitting set. So we find the lowest rule and we add as a tree of the rule, okay? This is going to be the next uh, state. So, uh, in addition, uh, since we want the minimum size uh, splitting set, we are going to uh, have a, a price for, for, for the, for the, um, for the arcs uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the search state. Uh, so the cost of moving from a state S to state S1 is actually the number of atoms that we added. Okay, uh, so, so actually what happens it's the, is that the past cost is actually the number of atoms 
in the final state of the past, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, since we are using uh, since we are using uniform cost, uh, 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 we are going to to have the goal state with the minimum uh, uh, length, uh, the minimum cost of pass, which is minimum size uh, speaking. Okay, so let's take the example that we have. We have this program, uh, we have this uh, uh, graph, and we want to compute uh, a splitting set. Okay, so you can see here the cell. We start with empty uh, uh, state, and uh, um, we said that the empty state, from the empty state, we can go to one of the sources. So we have here two sources. We have the source AB, and we have the source BC. So we add, uh, in, for this uh, child, we have AB, and for this child, we have CD. And the cost is two, because we added two atoms. Okay, so the cost is two. Now, you, we are in the uniform cost. Uh, the price is the same. So uh, suppose we, we take this one, and uh, so we look at this, and uh, this is not a splitting set, and the lowest uh, uh, rule that show, uh, demonstrate, demonstrates it is rule, uh, rule number four, because we have a D in the set, but we don't have G, okay? So we add G. Actually, we have to, to, uh, to add all the three of, uh, of this rule, which is GDC. So if we look here, GDC, uh, it's this, this three, okay? Add this three to the set, so we have CDG, and the cost is one. So now we have in the tree uh, two, no, two leaves. We have this leaf, leaf this leaf with a, with a cost two plus one, three, and this leaf is with a cost two. So we continue from here. Okay, and we look at the lowest uh, rule that violates uh, the, the fact that this is a, a splitting set. And we go to this rule number two. And we have to add to AB the tree of uh, E. Okay, so uh, the tree of E is actually E, H, A, and B. Okay, so we add all this. And the cost is two because we added two atoms. So now we have, we, we don't, this is a, actually a goal, a goal a, a state, but we don't open it yet. So we have one leaf with cost four and one leaf with cost three. So we have to go on from here. Okay, and, and, this, and this continues. So the child of this rule is going to be uh, this because uh, this, uh, this set, uh, this rule, according to this rule, this set is not a splitting set. Uh, so we have to add three variables. So now we have one leaf with cost uh, six and one leaf with, with cost four. So we take, we look at here and we find out that it's a goal state, it's splitting set and we find this, okay? So this is how uh, the search goes. Now, what is a complex? Actually, what we show is minimum uh, a size a non-trivial splitting set can be computed time polynomial in the size of the program. So how do we show it? So as I said, we are looking now at uniform cost and the time complexity of uniform cost is bounded by the size of the tree that we generate uh, through the, in the search, okay? So the, the complexity is the size of the search tree. Now what is the size of the search tree? Okay, now the height of the tree cannot be larger than the number of rules in the program because in each step, except from the first one, uh, we use a, a rule, okay? Once we exhausted all the rules, we don't, the, the tree will not go, uh, the tree will not uh, grow anymore, okay? So the height is, of the tree is bounded, uh, is bounded by M. Now, um, except for, for, for the initial state, the initial state has, um, has the children as a, as a number of the of the sources, right? But the next each next each each state that is not an initial state will have only one child because it take, we take the uh, rule with the uh, the lower rule, which according to which is the the state that we have is not a splitting set. Okay, so uh, 
the number of, uh, of children of the initial state is B, which is the number of sources, and the height of the tree is M. So the size of the tree is B times M, okay? Which is, uh, as I said, number of, uh, this is the number of uh, sources and this is the number of rules. Okay, now each step, we still have to think about each step where we look uh, uh, for violation of uh, the set as a splitting step. So in each step uh, in the tree, we also use a polynomial uh, uh, time, uh, 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 we, we, look, we use a computational time, which, which is polynomial in the size of the program. So the whole process is polynomial. Okay. So, uh, so as I said, we, what, we, what we show here is actually that uh, uh, the whole program, the, the splitting set can be computed in polynomial time. And as I said in the beginning, this algorithm can be adapted to other properties that we want from a splitting set. Uh, for example, a splitting set with a minimum number of rules, a splitting set that defines a, a bottom number with a minimum number of rules, or splitting sets that defines that defines a, a head cycle prob, prob, program, etc. Now, uh, since I see that my time is running, <laughs> um, I just want to show you experiments that we did where we tried actually to take random uh, programs and compute the minimum size splitting set. Very interesting. Uh, so we took uh, uh, rules. Uh, we, we generated randomly uh, programs with, which has three atoms rules, non-negation is failure, okay, so it's actually uh, 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 no, a very, very simple programs. And what you can see, and is, what can you see is that uh, we tried uh, computing the splitting set uh, for uh, 50 variables, 40 variables, and 20 variables. And this is a graph that shows um, here we have uh, the relation between the number of rules and the number of variables in our experiment. This, so, this, this, uh, here we have the average size of splitting set. And it's very interesting to see that starting from uh, about 4.25, uh, the size of the splitting set is actually equal uh, to the size of the variables in the program, which is not, which is very bad, right? And and incidentally, this is actually the relation the the the, the uh, relation between rules and variables that we have uh, in the transition uh, uh, between uh, hard and easy uh, SAT problems. So, but this is this is the these are experiments that we must continue because we did it with very few variables and it's only a preliminary. And I think I'll, I'll stop here. So it's indeed about lazy grounding. It's about answer set programming. Um, so I guess most of you are uh, aware of what that is. Um, I will start by giving you the conclusion of this talk. I guess then you know what, what we're working towards. So um, the traditional answer set uh, solvers are ground and solve systems. They, they first ground the program to a propositional one, and then call a solver. Um, lazy grounding is, well, let's say, a, a more recent class of techniques in which these two phases are interleaved, and they have complementary strengths. Um, this work is a step towards getting insights into where these strengths come from. So specifically, this is about um, applications on which ground and solve systems are much better, and what we try to do is analyze from a theoretical perspective why this is the case and then try to integrate, try to improve lazy grounding algorithms um, by using these insights. That's a, a long-term goal. And here particularly what we focus on is on what kind of propagation can we miss because of grounding lazily? Because certain clauses that might end up in the, in the solver are not there because we're doing lazy grounding and then propagation can be missed. Um, and especially we want to, well, not entail too much computational overhead to detect this. So what we don't want to do, of course, is um, grant the entire program anyway, and then see um, if, if a certain class would propagate. And in that case, we add it to the solver because then we're not gaining anything. But the, the goal of this lazy grounding is to avoid 
to make this entire parameter. And specifically, this paper is about completion formulas. They're very standard in, in, in ground and solve systems. Um, and up to, well, today, lazy grounders don't, don't add this kind of completion formulas for reasons that we will see soon. What we do now is, is identify a couple of mechanisms by which we can see, by which we can detect completion formulas, basically. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't implement this yet. So we still have to evaluate the, the effect of this. Um, so that's roughly, roughly what this talk is about. So some context, well, answer set programming, it's a well-established knowledge representation paradigm. Most systems work in two phases, grounding and solving. Um, lazy grounding starts from the observation that sometimes large parts of the grounding can be useless. Um, useless as in the solver never needs them. Um, the grounding can also be too, too large just to fit in memory uh, in some applications. Um, and the goal of lazy grounding is to interleave the grounding and the solving and to only ground what is required for correctness of the solver, to only ground um, these parts that are really required. Now, our goal with this presentation is to go from only grounding what is required for correctness of the solver towards grounding what is useful for the solver. So that's the, say, the long-term goal to get a system that can figure out, well, it will not figure out everything, but at least in large parts, uh, which things should be useful for, for improving the search performance of the solver, not just the minimum that's required for correctness of the solver. So I will first um, tell you a bit about how grounding works, roughly. So in answer set programming, we have this kind of rules. They have a head, they have a body, a body. This is a positive part of the body and a negative part of the body. And typically, um, um, bottom-up grounders, which is the most common class of grounders, they will do roughly whenever an instantiation of the positive part is found. And found means some, they, this occurs in the head of a rule. In that case, they will ground the rule. For instance, if there is a rule with Q to three in the head, I don't know, it doesn't matter really which rule it is. And there is some rule with R um, uh, three, four in the head that has been grounded, that have been grounded before. In that case, it will ground this rule with X equal to two, Y equal to three and Z equal to four. That's what will happen. Um, so this is, and of course there are many techniques to do this efficiently, but that's, that's really what's going on. Um, now lazy grounding, um, so I, I said it already, it interleaves um, grounding and, and solving. So we, we don't just have access to which atoms occur in the head of a rule, we also have an assignment for them because there's a, there's a solver going on. This solver, it will have seen certain atoms, it will not have seen other ones, it can assign values to the ones it has seen. And the idea of lazy grounding as well, let's do exactly the same, except that we will only ground in case we find a true assignment to these atoms. So this means that if we have a rule Q23, uh, so with this in the hat, I don't know what the body is, it doesn't matter so much, and the rule R34, only when the solver- We yes. cannot see your writing. Philip also mentioned this. Uh, what's the problem, sorry? Are we supposed to see your writing, or what, what you draw? Yes. Uh, we cannot see it. Oh, that's strange. I see it. Um, so yeah, that, that uh, makes it quite hard to follow. Uh, wait, I will just, but you can see my slides, right? Or not? Yes, we can. Um, so let me get, um, let me try sharing again that I will. Uh, um, so, so here we were. Um, can you see it now? Perfect. Okay. Okay. So I have to share my entire screen and not just this screen and not just this window for some reason. Okay. So in any case, so suppose we now have this rule Q23 and R34. They, they have some body. I don't care what it is. Um, so the, in the event we're doing lazy grounding, these rules have been grounded. The solver is aware of them. The solver is not aware of this first order rule. That's the task of the grounder. The solver, as soon as he has seen these rules, he will be able to assign truth values to this atom and to this atom. And only when he assigns true to, to them will this rule be grounded. 
that's the idea of lazy planning. Now, um, just a very small example um, where this would be very useful. This is, of course, an extremely artificial example, what you see here. Um, suppose we have this, this rule here, this first rule. It says that for exactly, exactly one value between 1 and 100, P of that value is true. And then we have a rule here that really blows up in the sense that it is a very large predicate, large arity, and the body says if P of X1 is true and P of X2 is true and so on. In practice, there are only 100 useful instantiations of this rule in which X1 equals X2 and so on, uh, equals XK. Um, and a, a normal bottleneck grounder will not create just these rules, but will try any possible instantiation of values between 1 and 100 for uh, X1 and X2 and so on. So um, this is an extreme example of where lazy grounding would be, be useful. Um, so it's lazy grounding works very well for avoiding useless parts of the, of the, um, the grounding. But on the other hand, it also has disadvantages, namely that the search performance is quite bad. Um, this is improving in the sense that um, technique, techniques such as um, um, CDCL have been, have been transferred to lazy grounding, but still search performance is, um, it, is far from comparable to, to um, standard solvers. And there are many possible reasons for this, but one important hypothesis is that, that this is for a large part due to missed propagation. Um, for instance, um, if, we, if we would have a rule of this form, just saying P always has to be false, uh, a lazy grounding system that really only grounds as, as little things as possible will not propagate that P is false for everything, every P he sees, he will, he will wait until it is made true by the solver to then say, oh, now I will give you the rule that P has to be false. Um, each of these things we can we can think about how can we avoid them um, and but this talk in particular we're not concerned with this issue uh, we're concerned with the issue of missing completion formulas so what do i mean by that um, well another so the, here you now see three instantiations of the rule i had before suppose these are the only three instantiations because of um, whatever q and r um, are um, now Standard um, grounders will add a clause, um, maybe I have it here, I don't have it here, saying that, well, if P of one is true, in that case, um, so this is just a normal implication, one of three things should be true. In practice, they will replace these by new atoms, say beta one, beta two, beta three, and say, and a new rule, P of one if um, beta one, P of one if beta two, and so on. And it will say, if P of one is true, one of the three has to be true. So either beta one or beta two or beta three has to be true. Okay, this is known as completion formulas. Lazy grounding doesn't add these and there's a very good reason for it because in order to be able to add this kind of, of constraints, you need to be aware of what are all the possible rules that can derive a certain atom. And since we're grounding lazily, we don't know that in advance. So we don't know whether more rules will come in uh, that, that can derive a certain atom or not. So what, what, what we're doing now is to search for a mechanism in which that allows us to, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, detect that, okay, we've seen all rules that can derive a certain atom. So we, we, we know that we can add this completion formula. So to extend this, uh, the lazy grounding with this ID. Um, and so what I will present next is five IDs, all of them actually quite simple. Um, and they're based on, on the idea of a bound, which is um, a function that takes substitutions of, uh, so a bound for a certain rule takes substitutions of certain variables. So X here is a set of variables and it returns substitutions for other variables in that rule. And well, it says here, it captures relevant substitutions in the sense that what I want is that if I give you a substitution for the axis, I want to have an over approximation of all possible substitutions for the Y. That can be relevant for this rule. Um, the examples will clarify this. Um, and preferably we're, in, we're interested in small bounds and, and tight bounds in the sense that, um, well, for instance, functional bounds we would be very happy with. 
So that's saying that, oh, for every uh, instantiation of the axis, there can be um, at most one of the y's. Um, what we can do then is, suppose we have all the rules. Uh, so we, we, we have the, the non the non ground rules, of course, the first order rules, we have them. And suppose that for a given, uh, a given atom, um, H, it's a, it's a ground atom, we have all the rules that could possibly have this H in the hat after instantiating it. That we can see it, it's just an analysis of the first order level. Um, and suppose that we have all of, that we have bounds for all of these rules. In that case, we can detect when, when all the instantiations that the, that the bounds declare um, can be relevant have been grounded. And in that case, we can add the completion formula. So this is just a, a rephrasing of the previous completion formula. Um, so we can add this. Just, I'll give you, uh, this might seem a bit complicated, but I'll give you the, the ideas. The first one is, like, is very simple. Non-projective rules in the sense that all variables that occur in this rule actually also occur in the hat. Um, so we see x, y, um, double x, double y. This was taken from some, I don't know which, which, uh, which um, benchmark family it was from one of the competitions. Actually, most of the rules are from um, one of the ASP competitions. Um, of course, if this is the only rule that, that defines move, then we know that move is actually um, that there for every instantiation of the x, the y, the x, x, and the y, y, there's at most one rule that can derive it for this. If we have a couple of rules for move and all of them are, are non-projective, then we know for each of them there will be at most one relevant instantiation that, that could ever have this move in the head. So we know as soon as each of these rules has, has been grounded, we can add the completion formula. This is a very simple idea. Um, and in fact, partly, so we're, we're working in the context of the alpha system, the, the, which I think is the most efficient lazy grounding, uh, a lazy grounder up to date. Um, actually, this, these completion formulas in practice in alpha were added already for non-projective rules in case there was a single non-projective rule for a given predicate. But if there were two non-projective rules, it was not done yet. So that was a very special case in which case it, it already happened. Um, the second idea is functional dependencies. For instance, now we have a, a variable um, mm, u1 occurring in the body, but not in the head. But we can see from the built-in predicates that u1 is functionally dependent on u. And what, the, what that means is, well, we, for a lot of built-in predicates, for instance, here the built-in predicates, plus if you, want, if you want to see it as a ternary predicate, we can derive patterns. We can just list what are the patterns of functional dependency. So which argument position depends on which one. And if we have this kind of functional dependency, like for instance, in this rule, again, we can um, derive that for every instantiation of the head, there will be at most one instantiation of the body that, that um, could ever derive this head. So again, we can add this kind of completion formulas. We know that later on, no extra, um, no extra rules might, might come from this because this only variable that occurs in the body but not in the head is functionally dependent on variables in the head. So that's the second idea, taking functional dependencies into account. And that, of, of course, really depends on, on having these built-in predicates, such as plus here, um, from which we can start to get these uh, dependencies. So this comes from the partner's unit uh, problem. Another idea is, this comes from, from Graf Colwick, is maybe we can take domain predicates into account, such as we have a color here, and now this, this bound becomes less strong. So what we had previously was that every rule could, could derive only one. Uh, there could only be one instantiation deriving a certain hat. Now we will have multiple. But this comes from a graph coloring, where we have that the node is colored if, well, some C has been assigned to it, to it, and C has been a color. Now I know some of you might think, what is that doing there? It doesn't need to be there, but I'll come back to that later. So um, this third idea is, well, this color, it's a, it's a domain predicate. It will just be given by facts, actually. We can exploit that. So if there are three colors, we know that there are at most three um, relevant instantiations of this rule for a given node n. So for any node n, if we know that if, if three instantiations of this rule have been grounded, then we know it's finished, that we have seen all of them. So we can add the completion formula again. 
Um, and then the fourth idea is, well, we can go combine this kind of bounds. For instance, if we have um, a bound that says, well, given the variables in X, you can determine um, the ones for Y1 and the ones for Y2, then we can combine it to a bound that determines the union. You can compose them. Um, for instance, in this rule here, you see that, well, we have only this variable X in the hat, but C functionally depends on X and U functionally depends on Z. So indeed we can get all the variables of the body. So you can go compose bounds. You could combine this as well with domain predicates and so on. Um, and so, well, that's, these are the basic IDs. And then our fifth idea is to go one step further, to do, to do this in some kind of recursive fashion. Um, so the idea there is to what we call in the paper bound to have bound some argument positions. For instance, in most encodings you will see for graph coloring where you have the note is colored, people will not write this here. They will just say a note is colored if some color has been assigned to it. And, and they, you don't need to mention that this C has to be a color because the only thing that, that will ever be assigned to a note are colors. And how do you know that? Because, well, the rule for assign will be of the form assign and C is possible if um, C and is a note and C is a color. So the idea, the next idea is that, well, but from this rule, we can, if this is the only rule that defines a sign, we can derive that the, the, the argument position, the second argument position of a sign, actually there's a bound on that. We, we also call it a bound. There's a bound on this position, namely this, this domain predicate here is a bound on what can occur in that position. So from rules, from bounds on rules, we derive bounds on argument positions and these bounds on argument positions can then subsequently again be used to find bounds on other rules. And that's the way that this, this happens recursively. So they nicely interact. This can also, um, let me see if I have, an, uh, I don't have an example with the functional dependencies, but this can also happen with functional dependencies. For instance, what, what is seen quite often is a predicate uh, next that defines um, the next cell, for instance, given a certain move and it has next x, x plus one, uh, y, y plus one, uh, or, or maybe this is just a y, 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 if a certain condition holds. And by having this kind of next rules, we can see that from all these rules on next, um, and there's prob probably a direction here as well, a direction D, that from the direction, the x and the y, we can functionally, we have a functional dependence that tells us what the other two arguments are. Which means that in all rules where this next predicate occurs in the body, positively at least, we can use this functional dependency to get bounds on what the possible instantiations of that rule might be. And so, so the rules, they give us functional dependencies on argument positions and the argument, these functional dependencies, again, give us give us bounds on, on possible instantiations of the rules. So this nicely interacts. Um, so then about implementation and, and experiments, I already spoiled this. Um, so this slide is intentionally left blank. So this is a to-do, uh, we didn't implement it yet. Um, we started, but then uh, we started a, um, a refactor of alpha. So um, yeah, we, we don't have anything to show yet there. Um, so that already concludes my talk. I don't know uh, how I was with time. Um, we've seen the slide already, so uh, I would be happy to uh, answer questions. Uh, it's nice to um, uh, uh, to to be here presenting uh, joint work with Tommy Ahunen, Matthias Knoch, John Light, and Stefan Voltren. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as less technical as possible. So the, so unset programming is a declarative language based on the stable model semantics of logic programs. 
Uh, and the idea is that a, a problem is declaratively encoded as a logic program, and then the stable models correspond to the solutions of the problem. And due to the value of very efficient solvers, ASP has found application in real world industry, uh, ranging from scheduling, uh, pet finding uh, in Amazon warehouse robots, railway safety system configuration, recommender systems, for example, in e-tourism or even biology, protein structure prediction. And uh, when programming on large, a uh, model approach is a fundamental to is the, the creation and reuse of uh, programs. So each model can be seen as a simple program with well-defined interface so that we can compose these models and create large programs. Uh, in this kind of approach is usually necessary to simplify a program, namely by making it more declarative since unset programming is a declarative language. It may be the case that we have introduced auxiliary atoms that don't have a declarative meaning. So we want to remove them while keeping the represented knowledge about the, those atoms. And this can be done precisely with forgetting uh, in ASP. Forgetting ASP is, is really about language reduction. So the result of forgetting a set of atoms from a program should correspond to a program uh, with only the remaining atoms so that in some way the, it is preserved the knowledge about those atoms that was encoded in the, in the, in the original program. So forgetting in ASP has been studied. Uh, many different approaches exist and along with the set of desirable properties. Among these, the strong persistence property uh, is the property that best characterizes forgetting because it precisely corresponds to the intuitive idea of forgetting. Uh, and also because other, other properties, uh, most of all uh, properties are consequences of SP. So the idea is to prefer, preserve all semantic dependencies uh, contained in the original program, uh, except for the atoms that were forgotten. And this includes uh, not only the direct dependencies, but also the indirect dependencies between atoms. For example, if A depends on B, B depends on C, C depends on D, then there is an implicit dependency between A and D and we should preserve that dependence in the result of forgetting. So forgetting is well studied uh, and we have the intended property for forgetting. So in order to apply it to model and set programming, we, we only need to choose a, a forgetting approach that satisfies SP and apply it to, to, to our case. But there is a problem. Uh, it was proven in 2016 that it's not always possible to forget and satisfy SP, meaning that there is no forgetting operator uh, that satisfies this uh, property. Which brings us to the, the question of uh, how can we forget in modern SP? Is strong persistence the adequate property in this setting? Uh, in order to, to, to see this, we need to take a closer look at the formal uh, definition of strong persistence and strong persistence imposes the preservation of answer sets even in the presence of an additional program over the, the remaining atoms and preservation means that there be a correspondence between the answer sets of the original program and those of the result of forgetting uh, this uh, correspondence on the remaining atoms and this correspondence should hold no matter what additional program we add to both. Uh, this is close related with the notion of strong recluvers, uh, but it takes into account that a set of atoms has been forgotten. Uh, if we take a look at uh, uh, an ASP model, uh, we see that it has a, a program and uh, an interface, an input and an output. Uh, the input is composed only by atoms. Uh, so when in, in an ASP model, when we calculate the, the answer sets of a program, we can only add uh, a set of facts to, to the program. And this is closer to the notion of uniform equivalence, 
which is a weaker notion of a strong uh, equivalence. So which this renders uh, SP too strong when uh, we consider forgetting in, in models. So what we need is a, a notion of uh, a property more aligned with uniform equivalence. And we have defined uniform persistence, with, which is a weakening of strong persistence, where the correspondence between the answer sets of the original program and the, those of the result of forgetting should hold no matter what set of facts is added to both. So we don't impose that this is the case for all programs, but just for uh, sets of facts. So now that we have uh, defined uh, a property that characterizes forgetting and SP models, uh, we just need to find an existing approach of forgetting that satisfies UP. So the question is which of the existing approaches satisfies UP? And we have proof that none of the existing class of forgetting operator in the literature satisfies UP. Uh, in the beginning, it was a bit, uh, a bit surprising, but if we uh, take into consideration that uh, most of the work done in forgetting in ISP relied on the notion of strong equivalence, this in the end, uh, it, it's not so surprising. So in order to overcome this problem, we have defined a new class of forgetting operators. And we did that in a semantical way. Uh, which is a common practice in forgetting ASP. And what we did was for each program and set of atoms we want to forget from a program, we have characterized the set of models a result of forgetting should have. This is quite a technical construction whose details uh, can be found in the paper, but I will show the result of forgetting in, a, in an example. So consider the following program P, and suppose we want to forget P and Q from this program. First thing we need to note is that the result of forgetting should be a program over the remaining atoms. So it should be a program of, uh, I can only write rules over A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, And it should preserve the answer sets. First, if we take a look just to the answer set of uh, P, we note that uh, it has only one answer set, which is composed of A, E, and P. Uh, so the result of forgetting should have only one answer set and should correspond to this one, except for the atom that we, except for P that we have forgotten. So the, 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 the result of forget should have only one answer set, which is A, E. Uh, but we have seen that the result of forget should not only preserve the answer sets of the program, but also this correspondence should hold even if we add to both a set of facts. So consider that we add to this program uh, uh, just the fact B. So B is the case. So uh, now we only have one answer set and now C is also the case. Uh, and we can see that A is no longer the case. So uh, 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 a possible result of forgetting according to our definition is composed of these three rules. And uh, it should be noted that in fact, using this uh, construction, we guarantee that implicit relations between atoms uh, in the original program even if they are given through uh, uh, atoms that were forgotten, are preserved in the result of forgetting. For example, uh, the, the, the implicit relation between A and B is preserved through this uh, rule here, A if not B. The implicit relation between C and B is also preserved. Uh, and, and some implicit relations are not preserved because they cannot hold uh, for um, if we add uh, uh, atoms. For example, take, in, take this rule that says that uh, uh, D depends on A, but uh, Q must also be the case. Uh, since Q is not true here, and we can only add uh, facts over A, B, C, D, and E, uh, Q will never be true. So this rule, 
is discarded from the, the result of forgetting. In the case of E, since it depends on not Q, not Q, uh, a, a Q is not true, and it will never be true because we can only add facts over the remaining at, uh, atoms. Uh, uh, e is, is uh, in the result of forgetting is a, a fact. Okay. Now, um, since we define the, the, the class of um, operators semantically, we can ask whether this is, is well defined in the sense that we can ask if, in fact, there is an operator in the class, if, if the class is non-empty, and we prove that there exists a concrete operator in the class. So we show how to construct for each program and set of atoms to forget from the program, how to construct a concrete program, uh, which is the result of forgetting according to, to the semantic definition. And we have proved also that the class uh, satisfies UP. So every operator, uh, concrete operator in the class satisfies UP. These two uh, uh, results together indeed uh, imply that in fact for, if we take UP as the property we want to have for model ASP, we can always forget what, what we want. Uh, we also, approve uh, uh, a soundness result, um, which is important uh, that for on programs, uh, this class we have defined coincide with all major classes of forgetting operators in node theory. This is important since in this class of on programs, it is well established what forgetting should be. So this is uh, like a soundness result of the class. So we, we now apply the uh, forgetting to a concrete approach uh, on model uh, ASP, namely DLP functions, uh, which is a preeminent um, approach to model ASP, which has a concise input-output interface in compositional semantics. So a model is composed of a logic program and a partition of the set of atoms into the input atoms, output atoms, and the hidden atoms, which are those that don't appear in, uh, neither in the input and the output. The input and the output are usually called the, the visible atoms. Okay, and we can forget applying, uh, forgetting, we can forget input atoms, uh, output atoms, and also hidden. Uh, when we apply forgetting, to the program of a model, we need a notion of equivalence between models to be able to compare the original model with the model resulting from forgetting. Uh, we have a notion of uh, equivalence between uh, models, but this requires that there is a, a, a existent, uh, there is a bijection between answer sets, and this is too strong uh, because it does not take into account that result of forgetting does not have the atoms that were forgotten. So we need a notion uh, of equivalence that takes this into account, that they are atoms that were forgotten. And uh, we define a notion of equivalence that imposes coincidence of the input, the output, and the answer sets. All of these model uh, the atoms that were forgotten. So using this notion of uh, equivalence, we can show that uh, uh, all operators, if we use operators from the class we have defined, forgetting atoms either in the input, output, uh, and hidden atoms preserves uh, this equivalence, meaning that the, the original model and the result of forgetting are the equivalent. We also prove, and this is, is quite important, that all atoms can be forgotten iteratively, meaning that if you have a set of atoms you want to forget, you can forget one by one and in each order. So the order is not relevant. In the end, uh, the result will be equivalent. Now we have, sh we have seen how to forget one in one particular model. Uh, what about compositional semantics? Suppose we have several models, thus forgetting first from each model and then use composed semantics gives the same as composing first and then forgetting. And we have shown this, this is true, but only for atoms that are not shared between 
models. So just take a look at this example. We have two models. One, the first one, which has C as input, uh, B as output. The second one has B as input and A as output. The above theorem uh, says that we can forget A or C and still preserve the compositional semantics. And this is the case for any program uh, P1 and P2 that we have in these models. But the same is not true uh, with respect to B because B is shared by these two models. It is in the output of one and the input of the other. So uh, there is no guarantee uh, of preservation of compositional uh, semantics if we forget B from this first from these two models. So in fact, if we forget first P from uh, the two models uh, and then compose, we may lose uh, information. So what is the a possible solution for this uh, problem? We propose two, uh, first one, simple one, provided that we have access to the models. Suppose that we, there are several models and two of them share an atom to be forgotten. Then the first uh, simple idea is to uh, join these two models prior to forgetting. So we, uh, uh, after, after joining these two models, we don't have uh, problems and then we can preserve compositionality. If uh, combining entire models can be seen as too strong, we can use a more uh, fine grain uh, approach and use the, the notion of splitting. So what we do is to, uh, instead of combining entire models, first split uh, and combine only the, the part of the models that really depend on the atom we want to forget. In this way, we, we have a more fine grain than the previous solution uh, to uh, the rearrangement of the models. And then we can uh, preserve the compositional semantics. Let me just uh, conclude by saying that we have done a thorough in investigation of forgetting in, in modular and suset programming. We have defined uh, a property which is tailored for modular and suset programming. And um, we have proved that none of the existing uh, classes of operators in the literature satisfies this, um, this uh, property and we have proposed uh, a class that satisfies. Uh, and, and we have shown that uh, if we take this uh, property, uh, we can always forget. So in FUP, uh, uh, this class allows forgetting all atoms from ELP functions, input atoms, hidden atoms and output atoms. Uh, the problem is that compositional, uh, the compositionality of the semantic is no, no longer guaranteed, namely for those atoms that are shared by uh, two models, and we propose reconfiguration as a, a mean to overcome this problem. Regarding future work, uh, our idea is to study forgetting on under, uh, other modular, uh, other approaches to model ASP and to study the precise relationship with uh, uniform equivalence. Although uniform persistence was based on uh, uniform equivalence, we, did not, uh, we don't have a, a formal relationship between the, the two notions. And also quite important, uh, our aim is to, to find a syntactic uh, operator for forgetting uh, in the class UP. By syntactic, we mean that given a program and a set of uh, atoms to be forgotten, by a simple manipulation of the rules of the program, we want to, to be able to find the, the result of forgetting. Uh, and this concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention.